FAME and CIFA have been jointly commissioned by the historic England to create and promote two instruments of financial management specific to archaeological projects and archaeological contracts. An archaeological standard method of measurement and an archaeological cost information service. Some of us have been talking about this for several years inconclusively, uh, but the initiative for this now has come from Historic England on its own behalf, on behalf of other departments of governments, of governments that commission and pay for archaeological work. I've been commissioned by FAME to insist in this endeavour because I published a paper on the subject several years ago after studying construction management at the University of the West of England. But I am aware that there are others in this room that now have more experience in this field than me, and we will be calling on them to get involved. Indeed, the active involvement of as many people in this room as possible in this is critical to making this work. It's important that members of this organisation are aware of and familiar with these two instruments. Though they will not be mandatory, it is likely that those of you who, engaged, who are engaged in government-funded projects will have to use them in tendering and invoicing for work your companies undertake as contractors, and some of you will be responsible for the administration of those contracts undertaken by others in your role as consultants. <coughs> the latter will be very different from the responsibilities currently assumed by most archaeological consultants. Uh, training will be offered by CIFA and FAME. Indeed, these things, they're relatively straightforward, but they will involve very slight changes in how we go about doing, not the archaeological part of our job, but the paperwork job, the invoicing, the accountancy work. Uh, and this is particularly the case for people who work as consultants. You will not be able to rewrite a local authority brief and charge for it. You'll have to do, do some work. The terminology comes from the construction industry and has caused confusion amongst archaeologists in the past. <clears throat> A standard method of measurement is a set of rules and protocols by which so-called measured contracts are priced and paid for, by which the bills of quantities are prepared. A measured contract is one in which the contractors are paid for work actually done, as opposed to what they thought they had to do, verified on site by checking of quantities and dimensions. It is routinely used in the site investigation and civil engineering industries to which archaeology is directly comparable we sometimes delude ourselves with the belief that archaeology is uniquely complex. It isn't. It's different, but it's no more complex than civil engineering. Uh, a civil engineering project and an archaeological project are directly comparable. They tend to work in reverse and mirror to each other. But they are, a big civil engineering project is just as complex as an archaeological project. At its most simplistic, if a contractor is awarded a contract to build a rectangular block of concrete, two metres by two metres two by two metres, on one metre deep foundations, but because of ground conditions, it is necessary to increase the depth of foundations to two metres, the contractor would be paid twice as much for the foundations component of the contract. The difference between tender costs and payment received is based on a measurement of the as-built structure and comparison of the measured quantities with those specified in the contract. The process of measurement of payment is called valuation and there is a great deal of scope for confusion between our use of the word evaluation in here, and it is possible we might have to change some of our terminology. Most archaeological excavation and evaluation contracts now are valued on what is known as a lump sum basis, in which the contractor guesses how much they will have to dig up, process and analyse, and then cuts their cloth according to their means to arrive at an acceptable publication and hopefully a profit. We all do this, so there's no point in denying it. The initiative from Historic England and also the Department of Transport came because they're concerned that at the lack of transparency in archaeological costs. They're, they're worried, and they're correctly worried, that underspends or mis mismanagement on site is being paid for by assessment and analysis costs being bumped up. We all do this, so there's no point denying it. The lump sum system is very imprecise places much of the financial risk on the contractor. Uh, Historic England also believes it is reducing scope for the application of science to archaeological work and for the generation of public benefit because the financial outcomes of archaeological contracts from the contractor's perspectives are unpredictable. Measured contracts would balance that risk more equitably between contractor and client and provide a more predictable and transparent financial return for contractors. The bill of quantity, bills of quantities created for measured contracts would also allow curators 
to assess the adequacy of tendered costs. At the moment, it's very difficult for your creator, a local authority officer or his inspector, to assess whether uh, the tenders for a job are, are, are reasonable or are, are, are adequate. Um, most of them wouldn't understand what the cost meant anyway, but in a detailed bill of quantities where every item that's likely to be paid for is itemized, they can see at a stroke whether carbon-14 dates have been allowed for, whether purely environmental, all that sort of stuff has been allowed for. At the moment, the simplistic lump sum basis doesn't allow that to be done. I have run several contracts as a consultant on a measured basis, albeit with mistakes uh, at my expense, and it is perfectly applicable to archaeology. <coughs> the second part of this, the cost information service, and this is what caused most confusion when I last spoke about it, is a facility with which clients and their professional advisors and contractors, if they want to, excuse me, <coughs> can gauge the likely cost of a project before commencing on it based on comparison with completed real-life projects. It assists them in deciding whether to proceed and also whether received tenders are realistic. Historically, this was done using price books that listed a range of prices for types of work, such as plastering or foundation excavations, expressed as price per area or price per volume. With the advent of the internet, the RCIS developed the Building Cost Information Service, which is an interactive and highly detailed database of real construction project costs, which users can use can ta to calculate the likely cost of their project. Archaeological costs are not listed on the BCIS, but they should be, uh, and that might be a separate project, separate off, uh, side, side arm to this, but they, they should be. An archaeological cost information service would be an accessible and interactive database of real archaeological contract costs for real construction projects that clients and others could use to estimate the likely cost of archaeological works arising from a development or infrastructure project. When I and a couple of friends presented these topics to the IFA conference, at, I think it was at Leicester, I think there was quite a lot of misunderstanding in, amongst the audience about what we were talking about. So let's be absolutely clear. One, neither of these two instruments will be mandatory, though it is anticipated that archaeological contracts on government funding projects, such as those commissioned by Historic England, uh, Department of Transport, Highways England, or DEFRA, will use the archaeological standard method of measurement, and the cost, inf and the cost information will be published on the ACIS. Neither instrument requires a contractor to divulge the basis on which its costs are based i.e. its pay scales, charge rates, or profit margin. Most of us in this room could provide a cost for, uh, for instance, excavating a cubic meter of urban stratigraphy or processing human skeleton without divulging our pay scales, charge rates, or profit margins. Most of us could work out, estimate, estimate uh, the cost of an urban, a meter of urban stratigraphy with five or ten minutes to think about it. We're, we're doing this already intuitively. Furthermore, all of us will remain free to price individual contracts exactly as we see, see fit, irrespective of what we might have entered in a measured measure bill of quantities for, or the ACIS of pre previous contracts. If a contractor chooses to raise or lower their, lower their prices from one tender to the next, nothing associated with these two instruments will hinder that market freedom. They are no more restrictive than the IFA recommended salaries. So what are we going to do? We're going to invite expressions of interest in participation in the project from members of CIFA, FAME, and probably ALGIO. So, that's you. Specifically, we need a small committee of interested and experienced people from across the spectrum of subcontractors, contractors, and consultants, and hopefully from across Britain and Ireland. Preference will be given to those with a demonstrable experience of using measured contracts, and, and particularly those who've acted as QSs. If you, uh, some, some archaeological contractors employ QSs now, and we'd really like them to be on board, please. They will review, comment, contribute, and correct drafts of the ASMM and the ACIS that I produce. Provisionally, this will be done at collective meetings, probably virtual meetings, I don't know, but there's no reason for it not doing it by email, in much the same way that we sometimes produce WSIs collectively. I expect this to take about a year. We're with meetings every month, every two months, whatever. This committee will be called the Drafting Committee or the Drafting Panel. We're also going to invite representatives of the client bodies and the construction industry to sit on a second committee that will review the general progress and direction of the project to make sure that we are producing something acceptable to them. It has to be acceptable to them or they, they won't, simply won't use it. Provisionally, that committee will comprise representatives of, of Historic England, 
DEFRA, um, Highways England, or Department of Transport, landowners such as the MOD, uh, National Trust, uh, and the professions, ICE, RICS, RIBA, and representatives of some of the larger construction companies for whom we often subcontract, uh, the Balfour Beatties and, uh, and, and, and that lot, <coughs> some of whom are quite interested in archaeology. They will not get involved in the detail of the two instruments, but they will help set the general direction of travel. Specifically, they will be asked to ensure that what we produce is compatible with industry standards, such as civil engineering standard method of measurement for new rules of measurement from the RICS and the new engineering contract. This committee will be called the Review Committee or the Review Panel. And working in parallel with the Review Committee will be Kate Geary of CIFA, who will be QA manager. I will produce drafts of the two instruments and guidance notes to go with them. The ASMM will be a bill of quantities and guidance notes on how to use it. The ACIS will be a database. And we're going to try and open up these two files here. Is there an arrow on the screen? There is. There we go. Just like, just like Steve Jobs. Is that in focus? Yeah. In the back of the hall. Can you make it bigger? Is that, is that all right? I can't see the bloody arrow. This is the bill of quantities. Most of you have seen similar things. Uh, anyone who was, who was old enough to have um, worked in the 1980s where English Heritage or HPMC as it was provided most of the funding, we used to fill out similar things in applying for grants. Uh, most of this is completely uncontentious, I sh should hope so. You're asked to price uh, certain elements of, of the job. You can choose to price them if you wish to. You, choose, you don't have to price every element in a bill of quantities. Uh, and this is the sort of stuff that we think we should be seeing in a bill of quantities for a competent archaeological contract. All this is straightforward stuff. Uh, and in the model we produce, uh, the guidance notes will allow anyone filling this out to add extra details that they think are missing. There are, most, most sites always require something that not somebody hasn't thought about. Uh, so you can add extra fields in there, but you'll be required to keep the general structure together. Now I'll skip through this, and I'll come back to this in a second. Similarly, section E4, this is, this is just an example of how it might work. All this stuff is, is straightforward, it's as uncontentious. You would be asked, irrespective of whether we knew we are going to need C14 dates, you'd be asked to price the C14, C14 dates, TRM, whatever you want to. Processing of recovered materials, fine small samples, also completely uncontentious, I'd have thought. It's perfectly capable to price the processing of artifacts and finds by quantities. We all measure the quantities. And this is, this is, this is the key to all this. Archaeological contractors already record the volumes and quantities of everything they do. We're all doing it. Civil engineering quantity surveyors think it's, it's amazing that we do that. It would be impossible for them to get that anyone on a construction site to do it. We do it automatically. So this is all standard stuff, and some of you who have worked on jobs I've worked on will, will have seen this all before. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, so in, for the, 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 the consultant would, and this is the crux of the matter, that in preparing the, the, the uh, bill of quantities, the, con the consultant will be required to provide an indicative quantity. That means they will have to look at comparable sites for the area. If we think we're excavating a Roman site in Lincolnshire, Roman settlement site, they're going to have to read the published reports of Roman settlement sites in Lincolnshire to find out roughly what quantities of artifacts came out per cubic meter. Roughly. So we can put a, a, a quantity in there and the contractor can price against that quantity. If we find twice as much as that, the contractor gets paid twice as much. The point of that, it gives the client an indication what the likely cost of it is going to be. So 
those of you who are working as consultants are going to have to spend an awful lot more time reading published archaeological reports, which can't be a bad thing. The, the difficult area, and what's going to take up most of our time in dealing with this, am I, where's my arrow gone? Um, it doesn't matter. Is um, how do I get this to go up? Where's the? Uh... Oh, there it is. I've got it. Yeah. Oh, where's this thing coming from? The key, the crux to all this. is how we price and measure quantities of stratigraphy excavated. Now, this is where most of the discussion will take place, and this is where most of, most of the questions this morning, I hope, will, will come from, and observate valid observations. Um, it is relatively easy to measure volumes of archaeological deposits. We do it already. In our recording systems, we already measure it. There is no reason, or we cannot, simply put in, in our digital, uh, and I hope some of the people later on will be talking about this, in our digital recording systems, calculation fields that simply calculate the dimension, the volumes we've activated from. So we can produce already a volumetric total, a volumetric analysis of what we've done. We, all, we, we, we can do it. Uh, ironically, I think, it is ironic, urban sites are technically pro probably easier because uh, at its most basic, an urban site is a block of stratigraphy. We start at the top, we work, go down to the bottom. You've all got 3D uh, imaging equipment. You can produce instantly a 3D model and calculate the volume of the sites you've excavated. Rural sites involve, are, are relatively... They're, they're simple as well, but there's a, a bit more fiddly because they tend to be spread out over huge areas and there are more individual things. But again, we already record the volumes of those things. There's no, there's no, great, no great drama in in doing all this. So, but we will be having, I imagine, quite heated discussions about how we, how we do all this. Um, the other thing which is going to take up possibly a lot of our time is how we build into this system allowances for what we call post-excavation assessment and post-excavation analysis and determination. At the moment, I do it on a straightforward percentage basis. I asked the contractor to total up the cost, the predicted cost for the, for the field work uh, and give a percentage of that as their post-excavation cost. If the cost of the field work, if the, if the quantities encountered increase, then the allowance for the post-excavation analysis increases proportionally. Similarly, if the quantities encountered are less than expected, the percentage goes down, or the percentage, the, the, the quantity, the volume, the, the, the cost allowed uh, available for assessment analysis goes down as well. So it is a two-edged sword. It will not always guarantee bumper bonuses for archaeological contractors. Uh, it is, but it will give more transparency to our clients. Uh, let's close this down. You see that? Uh, will that get bigger? Can you see that? Say again? Okay, you don't need writing. This is O level maths. This, this is, these are the formulas for cal calculating volumes. Uh, any, uh, I'm showing my age, O level maths, right? GCSE math. Um, it's, it's dead straightforward. These are, these are the formulas for calculating volumes, and we just have to build these into our recording systems. Straightforward. The area for discussion, the subject for discussion, is how we deal with irregular shapes. Now, the civil engineering industry encounters irregular shapes all the time. We're not unique in encountering irregular shapes, they do it all the time. They, they might build straight walls straight foundations, but the holes they dig invariably are not. 
they dig a great big foundation inch, the sides is in, in irregular shape. They have a set of protocols by which that irregularity is allowed for. And we have to arrive at protocols that allow us to, uh, to, to measure that irregularity. Now, one way of doing it is taking the biggest dimensions in all three uh, um, axes and using that as a dimension. Our clients would say that's far too generous, but it, that's the sort of thing we're dealing with. Measurement of quantities on civil engineering sites and hopefully on archaeological sites does not have to be precise in the scientific sense of the word, but it does need to be accurate to a resolution acceptable to us and the clients. That's the whole point of the exercise. It doesn't have to be precise. And too, too many people get hung up on, on thinking we need to be precise, but it's not. How are we doing for time? Right. So we will have to build formulas like this into our site recording databases. Could you make that bigger? Now, the Archaeological Cost Information Service, what I'm calling it, is the thing that caused the most confusion. And we've discussed it at Leicester. Uh, and I think uh, uh, quite a lot of suspicion and a lot of fear. Uh, some people in the audience were worried it was going to be used to control what they charge for their work. It, is, it will not. It's not the purpose of it. This is, a sort of th this is just a sketch I knocked out the other day. You'll see it's not an OASIS data entry field. The point of the exercise is to, is to allow a property developer who's got a 10 hectare housing development site or a 4,000 square meter site in the middle of Birmingham or Chester or London to work out roughly how much the archaeological work of it is going to, side of it is going to cost him based on similar sites excavated elsewhere. So all this stuff, this is, we can, you know, originator, we'd probably have a code for people entering the data. You'd have to be members of either of FAME or CIFA to enter the data. Not everyone can do it, but it would be publicly ac accessible. Anyone could access it. Original date, site ID, locality, parish, whatever we want to call it. Something, something in there that indicates. Start year, end year, there's a reason for that. Uh, and it's to do with inflation. The building cost information service has an ca uh, inflation calculator field in it. So if, a, if, a, if the data was entered for a site that was uh, constructed in 1984, pressing the button allows you to work out what the cost would be adjusted for inflation over that period. Uh, we can add that in if we want to, but maybe we don't need to do, but it's relatively straightforward. That's, just, uh, that's what it's there for. <laughs> site type. I'm suggesting that um, from, and this is from the, from the developer's viewpoint, there are only three types of site they'd need to know about. Uh, you can't see it. Brownfield, greenfield, or maritime. As far as the developer is concerned, that's the only thing that matters. Brownfield. And we're not talking about, we're not, it doesn't matter to them whether it's Roman, multi period, prehistoric, whatever. It's brownfield, it's greenfield. Is it, is it an easy site? Is it a difficult site? Is it a soaking wet site? The stage, again, for them, are we talking about the costs incurred before planning permission was obtained or after planning permission was obtained? There was a critical to property development economics. They need to know how much was involved before they even knew they, were, they had a viable project. So that's it's critical stage. And complexity, I'm, I'm suggesting that we have three, four, maybe five uh, classes of archaeological complexity. And I, I suspect most of us in here in a five, ten minute conversation could work out roughly the criteria by which we might decide that. There are simple sites. There are difficult sites, and then there's everything else in the middle. There are those sites we would send a relatively inexperienced person to look after, and, the, and those sites we would only send our most experienced field archaeologists to look after. Wet, yes or no? So, and this is the calculator field. The gross cost, uh, the total cost of the archaeological works, the cost of the site works, maybe the cost of the post-site works. The gross development area, GDA means gross development area, so, so that, that's typically for your, brown, your greenfield sites, residential developments, that sort of stuff, or gross development volume, 
which is the site area calculated by the depth. So in urban sites, particularly where you've got lots of basement works, this sort of stuff, the volume is critical. And then you have a simple calculator field. The gross cost, the GDA, gives you the cost per hectare or the cost per meter cubed. And that is what property developers want to know up front. And this, allow, this would allow them to get that information relatively straightforward. Nothing in there tells your competitors how much you're charging per day for your time. We seem to be still a bit neurotic about that, uh, it's, and it's a bit embarrassing. But uh, we, should, we, should, we should be more open about what we're charging. But anyway, nothing in there does that. This allows people simply to find out how much a site is likely to cost them in advance. These drafts will be circulated amongst the drafting committee. Uh, meetings will be held during which the drafts will be reviewed, commented on, and amendments discussed and minuted for incorporation in second drafts. The process will be re repeated until the majority of the drafting committee are satisfied that the two instruments are acceptable to them. During the drafting process, the review committee will be sent each draft together with a short summary of revisions made to the previous iteration. I was involved in drafting the ICE conditions of contract for archaeological investigation, which is now the ICC. And this process went on over two or three years with a series of meetings uh, where the thing was constantly changed and reiterations published. It's quite tiresome work. It, uh, uh, it re requires a great deal of compromise, but it, but it does work. Only if a member of the review committee expresses serious disquiet about the form or detail of either of these two instruments will the drafting process be interrupted and the concerns of the review committee brought to the attention of everybody else, i.e. we retain control over the way this thing goes, and only if what we're doing is really, really uh, out of order will we, will we change tack. This is being done primarily for, for our benefit. The biggest risk to us, however, I think, is that the client bodies will consider the protocols to be too generous to archaeological contractors and the verification procedures not rigorous enough. The CESM, Civil Engineering Standard Method of Measurement, is a set of, set of rules primarily by which consultants, consulting civil engineers, verify the costs on site. And they have rules by which, it's rules for compiling a bill of quantities and rules by which they verify on site, and they're quite, they're quite strict. Uh, we have to, to develop rules that are equally strict and that have the confidence of the construction industry and their clients. Once the structure and the content have been finalized uh, of this, a database developer uh, will be commissioned to produce an internet accessible interactive database, provisionally Microsoft Access. I've been involved in the development of a thing called the Construction, <coughs> Construction History Society Online Bibliography, which is an internet accessible wiki bibliography of uh, bibliographic citations for what we recognize as buildings archaeology. Uh, was, the thing was uh, developed by a guy called uh, Dennis McDermott. Uh, anyone can access it. Only members of the CHS, which I'm a member, can add data to it. But it's a, you can look at it. It's a perfectly, very, very functional, searchable Microsoft Access database. It works, works brilliantly. And we'll be doing something like that. We will test the two instruments on live archaeological contracts and, if necessary, revise them again. I would like to do that part way through this, the project. We'll, but we'll see how we go. Uh, once the two committees and the QA manager are agreed that the two instruments are fit for purpose, they will be published. In the case of the ACIS, that will be hosting on a server. I, I, I will leave that decision to other people. Where, who hosts that? I don't know if it's hosted by FAME or CIFA, I don't know. The building cost information is hosted by <coughs> RCIS, RICS, which is the <coughs> professional institution. We're more of a trade body. Uh, the two instruments will be reviewed and, if necessary, revised psychically in response to comments from practitioners and the client side. Uh, and provisionally, FAME and CIFA would maintain a standing committee for that purpose. So that's what we're about to start. There are a lot of question marks, a lot of unknowns in it, uh, and I don't have all the answers to those. So I need, um, we need the active involvement of all of you, or a lot of you, particularly the, those of you uh, who've experienced in running measured contracts and, and if you employ QSs, we would like to speak to them as well. But that was my... <clears throat>